I would want to thank the Lord for this opportunity that we come here every Sunday to listen to his word, to have him uh, speak to us. And I just want to thank him for the opportunity every time we are able to come here, when especially you read about some countries that cannot meet in an open place to be able to share the word. So I welcome you. I also welcome those who are online that we can be able to work together, we can be able to listen to what the Lord is saying to us, and that the Lord is going to teach us greatly. So let's pray again. Our Father, we thank you. We appreciate you because of your mercy. We appreciate you because of your goodness and because of your grace. This is the day indeed that you have uh, made, and we shall be glad and rejoice in it. So we appreciate you so much for your goodness and kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I would want us to, uh, we are going to be talking today about the terms of his presence. Of course, we've been the terms of his presence. Uh, when you buy something, it is written somewhere, terms and conditions apply. I don't know whether you've ever read, although they write in small uh, letters, but it is always good when you buy a good, a new product, just go somewhere there and read there, and actually when you read somewhere, you find so many things that have been written there about terms and, and, con and conditions. And you're like, wow. And if you do not read them, you might be very shocked that uh, only for you to, to see a warranty uh, written there uh, 24 months, and then because you didn't read the terms and conditions, when you go to have your item repaired or to have it replaced, you are told, Ah, uh, by the way, what did you do with this item? I did this and this. Oh, by the way, you violated the terms and conditions. Therefore, we cannot replace your item. And you're like, no, it's written that uh, it's, there are terms, uh, you know, it's written that there's a warranty. And this is the, we have not finished 24 months. And you're like, no, there are terms and conditions. And, and therefore, that is what we're going to be looking at. When we talk about um, journeying with God, are there terms and conditions? And I would say, yes, there are terms, some terms and conditions. And uh, we would, uh, just let's go to that story where Moses had, had an interaction with the Lord. And uh, that is Exodus chapter 33. Just go to Exodus chapter 33. Let me look at... Um, thank you. You're there. Um, can you go to verse 14? Okay. Um, could you go back to 13? Yeah, we could start with from 13, and then we, we go downwards, and we see what. Now, if I have indeed found favor in your sight, please teach me your ways. I will know you and find favor in your sight. Now consider that this nation is your people. Then he replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So God is making a promise that he is going to walk with the children of Israel. Remember, they have been, um, the children of Israel have been rescued from, uh, from um, uh, Egypt and God has promised them, God has given them three promises. Okay, they are... Uh, there are many, but, but there, you can group them into three. He has promised them that I'm going to give you a land that is flowing with milk and honey. And therefore, he has already taken them, and then they are in the wilderness, and then he's walking with them. But there are quite a number of difficulties on the way. God has also promised them that he's going to, uh, to bless them. He had promised Abraham that he's going to bless him and he's going to increase them. And therefore, God has uh, had promised that he's going to increase them and he's going to... You know, as a, as a fulfillment to the promises he had given to, to, to Abraham. And therefore, and, and God, of course, has promised Abraham that he's going to make him a blessing to many people. And therefore, these children that are, are, are going with God, um, God is, through them, reaching the entire, uh, the entire of nations of the world. He is displaying his faithfulness to them as, as he promised to Abraham so that through them, 
then they can be a blessing to the whole world. But you see, when the, now they are in the wilderness, there are some problems that occur. And that is why this statement comes, it comes to this. And there is an argument that God is saying, I am not going to continue working with you. And the question is, why? Why is God saying that? And I, want, I would just want us to look at one major condition that, that, is, that God has about walking, us walking in his presence. God has one major condition. Um, there are several of them, but I just want us to focus on one of the major conditions. And that is what had brought this conversation to reach this stage. Let me just give you a background of what was happening. What was happening around this time is that Moses had been on the mountain for 40 days. And when he had been on the mountain for 40 days, that is when you read um, um, chapter, from chapter, uh, sorry, from chapter 33, um, Moses, uh, from chapter, no, it is not chapter 33, it's just, um, he has been there from chapter 20, if you remember where we have the laws, Moses had been given the laws. And after the laws, Moses is given the design of the tent of meeting that he was to make so that God can be able to meet with his people. So when he is in the mountain and God is revealing to him about the tent and he is describing to him how the tent will be constructed and how the priests will be dressed and how they will be able to approach and how they will be able to sacrifice, as he is receiving these instructions, down on the, uh, at the foot of Sinai, the children of Israel decide that this man, Moses, has delayed for a very long time. And therefore, they decide to sin against the Lord. They, they say, uh, we want to make um, a God who is going to help us go back to, 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 to Egypt. But then when um, Moses comes down the mountain, he finds that the children of Israel has, um, have gone against the Lord. They have sinned against the Lord. They have failed on one of the major co uh, commandments that was given. The first one, that was, have no other God beside me. And I would want to say that that is the first major condition. And that is what we are going to look into in this uh, uh, brief session that we are going to have. That have no other God beside me. And the children of Israel sinned against the Lord. And when they sinned against the Lord... God was offended by that. And that is why we come to this. That God is saying, I am not going to go with you because if I go with you, I will destroy you on the way because you are stiff-necked people. So therefore, we see that this world to go to, to, with God, but God is saying, for me to work with you, there are some terms, there are some conditions for us to work with the Lord. And Anytime we have a problem with the presence of God working with us, I want to submit to you that among the serious condition or term that we violate is this one of having another God. Having another source of security. Having another source where we say, like the children of Israel said, let us get another God to help us to go back where we came from. And that happens quite a bit. And we are going to look, what are some of the conditions? That's one of the things. What are some of the things that we go through that make us have another God? What are these other things that we go through as human beings, as believers, who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ? And as we do that, you may ask, is there these were the children of Israel. How do we come in? I want us to read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let, let us see how we come in as believers. And it gives us a very good story about why today's Christians, we are like the children of Israel. Okay, we are there. Um, that is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's read from verse 1. Now, I want you to know, brothers... This was a church in Corinth, and it was a church of, with Jews, Greeks, and all kinds of people were included. And then it tells them, I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers 
were all under the cloud. If you remember in the book of Exodus, that is where all the Israelites were under the cloud. They were being led by the cloud during the day, and at night there was a flame of fire. Then it tells them, all passed through the sea. And we know how Moses lifted his hand, uh, his staff, and God parted the Red Sea. And they passed through it. It continues. And were all baptized into Moses in the cloud. In other words, actually we are told that when they were under that cloud, it was a form of baptism that we also go through when we become believers. And then he tells them, um, and also in the sea, when they passed through the sea, it was not just passing through the sea, there was a greater significance about passing through the sea. And that is like when we go into the water and we are baptized. And we come out of the water. They went through that. The children of Israel, brethren, they were born again. Why? Because the Bible here is saying that they were baptized into Moses. That is in the cloud and in the sea. They ate some spiritual food. These people were spiritual. They had spiritual food. This manna was not just about uh, them getting their stomach full. It was, it was a spiritual food. In other words, we are now feeding on spiritual food as we hear the word of God. And any moment that you go through the scripture, you are feeding on the word, on, the, on spiritual food. Then we come, we take this Holy Communion, we are participating in spiritual food. And the children of Israel, we were told that that is what they did. We can um, um, all drank spiritual, uh, spiritual drink. And today we have done that. Brethren, these people were born again. They were saved from Egypt and also from Satan and from, from sin. And that is the picture that we are getting about it. And it continues. That followed them. That rock was Christ. You see, you know, when we hear about Christ, we think we are the one who, um, you know, Christ, uh, well, of course, was crucified um, during uh, this dispensation. But the Bible is saying that rock that Moses was told to talk to so that he can produce water, that was Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? And as we also come here and we have partaken of that, as I share with you this gospel, Jesus Christ himself is ministering to our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. Brethren, don't, we can't read this story and we imagine, when we talk about God's presence, we cannot just imagine it was happening somewhere in the wilderness many years ago, and we do not even know what was happening there. They were going through an experience that was pointing to our time. Praise the Lord. Amen. Can you imagine? Jesus was there. That rock was Jesus. And Jesus is still with us now. And he has been manifested. We know him more than they knew him. Them, they knew him. You know, they, they just would see a rock that was accompanying them. They didn't know that that was Jesus Christ. He would um, quench their thirst. And today, Jesus Christ quenches our thirst, brethren. Even as we share this, we might think it is, um, it is a it's not a ribina. There was a time we used to have some, some wine, but we had some, some challenges. But it's not about whether it's Raibina or whether it is wine. It is about Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. We try to say that, but we say, because it was, many people are getting stumbled by, by the wine. We said, let's go to Raibina, because it's not about the Raibina. It's about Jesus Christ. He is the rock from which we are drinking. Even as we worship here, as we drink from the Lord Jesus Christ, it is about Jesus Christ. May we not be stumbled. But I, I thought, what were you taking? It was Jesus Christ. Of course, it was um, the elements, but it, it signifies more than that. And the bread that, that signifies the broken body of Christ Jesus. And they went through that. But I want us, brethren, to go to verse 5, because that is where the message is. Where, where the terms and conditions come. And I have heard, I have discussed in forums, can somebody lose their salvation? And I think I, I, there's no need to answer that question with words. Let the Bible answer that question. Can somebody, these people were born again. These people drank spiritual, um, whatever, um, water. They ate spiritual food. These people were rescued by God himself. 
They were, walking, they were baptized into Moses when they went through the, the, the sea and when they went, went into that cloud. These people knew the Lord Jesus Christ. They had been rescued like most of us are today. But there is a but. God was not pleased with most of them. Praise the Lord. You know, one of the biggest problems we have in discipleship is that when you want to disciple somebody who thinks they have arrived, it's so hard to disciple such a person. But I'm already born again. Why do you want to talk to me? I got born again 40 years ago, 20 years ago, and I'm okay. I'm doing well. Of course, I have some few challenges, but God will sort that out. Just let me alone. And the Bible says that, but God was not pleased with most of them. And we are going to see four things, and then I will be done about the terms and conditions. But all of them revolve around one thing called sin. One of the greatest um, requirements, terms and conditions. Don't walk in sin. Because the moment you begin to walk in sin, deliberately without desiring to be rescued from that sin, and um, normalizing the sin, and continuing to walk with it, this is what the Bible says. God was not pleased with most of them. For they were struck down in the desert. How would God strike down people that have been baptized? People that are drunk spiritual water. People that have eaten spiritual food. People that have walked with the Lord. Have been rescued from Pharaoh. Like we have been rescued from sin. We have been rescued from the devil. And we have been rescued from the world. Why would God be angry with us? Why would we fall in the desert? Why? Now these things came to them as an example for us. So that we will not desire evil as they did. That is why it came to us. We will not desire evil as they did. And God was not pleased with them. Terms and conditions. We must trust the Lord to walk in holiness. Brethren. You know, um, for some time, uh, there was a time the gospel, I remember sometime the gospel, when you come to Christ, you'll be told, come to Jesus Christ and you will be rescued from sin. You will be rescued. You are going to, to be delivered from habits that do not please the Lord. Hallelujah. But then uh, sometime the gospel changed and it came to come to Jesus and you will stop suffering. It's come to Jesus and they will give you that thing that you have always desired. Come to Jesus. And by the way, Jesus does that. But I would say that the central message of the gospel was, was abused, I would say that. So that when people come to Jesus Christ, you hear somebody saying, I want to backslide. Why do you want to backslide? Because Jesus Christ has refused to do some things. I have been trusting Jesus for something to do to me, and he is delaying, and yet I have been faithful to him. And therefore, Jesus must answer some questions because I have some questions against Jesus. Why? Because I came and Jesus has not done one, two, three, four. And I think that is a very wrong gospel. That Jesus has come to rescue us from sin. Jesus has come to give us eternal life in his son. Jesus has come to give us adoption into sonship. And that Christ Jesus becomes our brother. And that Christ Jesus we become, becomes our father, becomes our Lord. And that we desire and we, um, a new heaven and a new earth is prepared for us. And a new city is prepared for us. Praise the Lord. And we have been rescued from eternal perishing and death. What could be more than that, brethren? What could be more than being rescued from eternal death and suffering? And being brought to the kingdom of light. Hallelujah. That city whose builder and maker is the Lord God Almighty. Why wouldn't that be the major motivation of us staying in Christ Jesus? That we have been rescued from sin and death. Why would we reach a stage whereby we have reduced the gospel to a few things that Jesus Christ has not done for me? That Jesus, I'm giving you this month. Jesus, I'm giving you this year. You must act. If you don't act, I will act. May God help us. May God help us. I'm telling you the truth. I have been in, in a situation whereby I have, had, I have failed and almost imposed and put some conditions for Jesus Christ. And, and, and 
I'm telling you the truth, we can be tempted to enter into that situation. Jesus, you did it for Moses. You did it for Abraham. Jesus, you must do it for me. In Jesus' name. And I'm telling you the truth, that we must never come to that place. Because we are, we have been rescued. We were slaves of sin. We were slaves of the devil. We were slaves of this world. And we were doing hard labor. We were being mistreated and harassed by the devil. Jesus comes and rescues us and puts us in a church and puts us in the, his body to take care of us, to prepare us for eternity. And Jesus is doing that. And then instead of us offering ourselves as living sacrifices and being ready, Jesus uh, removed the remaining sin. Jesus deal with us. Remove the selfishness. Remove my desire for sin and other things, oh God. Rescue me from sin and myself. Rescue me from the devil and his plans. Oh God, that is my prayer and that is my desire. We reach a stage where we are thinking, Jesus, we have a contract with you. You, you do my, your part, I do my part. Jesus, I've done my part. You are not doing your part. And therefore, I get discouraged. But I want to tell us, Jesus has a part he's doing. Well, let's continue uh, with, uh, with this. Uh, before I... With this thing, yeah. They did. Now, these things came as examples so that we will not desire evil. Let's go look at those four evils, then I will be done. By the way. Those four evils. You are there. And let's go to... Thank you. Don't become idolaters as they did, as idolaters. As the reason that see, people sat down and to eat and to drink and got up to play. So the first one is idolatry. Having some things that you are valuing more than Jesus Christ. And I came to discover when you find something you are putting a condition for Jesus to do, most probably that's an idol. Most probably, just investigate that thing. For those of us who have something that you are telling Jesus, if you don't do this, we will review our relationship. When you look at it very well, you'll discover it is an idol. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be, it could be that Jesus, I must graduate. If I don't graduate, we will review our That has become a God already. It could be an issue about marriage. If I don't get married, Jesus, this year, we will review our relationship. That has become an idol already. It might be something very good. It might be actually a spiritual, let me even shock you. It might be a spiritual thing you are desiring. Jesus, if you don't make me more holy, we will review. It could be something, it could, I don't know what it is. It could be something that looks spiritual. That Jesus, I want from this year, when I wake up in the morning, to be seeing your face physically. That's my prayer, Jesus. <laughs> Moses prayed it. I pray it also. Show me your glory. And if I don't see your face, Jesus will review. That has become an idol. Your desire to see the face of Jesus has become an idol. Your desire to be, to be has become an idol. And any idolatry, it's condemned in the Bible. Praise the Lord. What is it that you are telling Jesus we will have to review? You may not be saying it or rather with your mouth, but you, it's in your heart. And we reach there a lot. Uh, you know, we reach there a lot. You know, we have a program. Yesterday I was talking with my friend, Frank Were, and we were saying that one of the biggest problems we have about working with Jesus Christ, especially in our life, especially after college, is we have a program in our heart. In our mind, we have a program of how our lives should work, should be. I think even not... Uh, actually, when we are young, we are encouraged to have a vision. You remember that vision you are encouraged to have? That can become the greatest problem in your life because you have an ideal life that you must be living. And you are seeing it's not coming into place. I was supposed to be married by 29. And now I am 35. Jesus Christ. I was supposed to have graduated. I was supposed to have done this. And it becomes a big hindrance to our work with the Lord. It becomes a big hindrance. By now, by 40, I was supposed to have retired. And have accumulated enough to serve the Lord. You know, we, Christians are very good. They, they, they know the scriptures. To serve the Lord. I was supposed to be having a big house to serve the Lord. A big car to serve the Lord. Many children educated so that they can serve the Lord. Jesus Christ, we must review our relationship because these things are coming. They become idols and they must be destroyed. That is number one. If you have that, then you violate the terms and conditions of our walking with the Lord. Go and, and destroy that program. We had one with, actually with my wife, we had drawn a graph. We, I don't know where the graph went. 
We had drawn a graph. And God came and messed it up. He's still messing it up, and it's okay. <laughs> we said, oh, Jesus, mess it up. It's okay. That's an idol. Okay, let's go to the second one. Um, don't let, okay, that is the first one. Let us not commit sexual immorality like some of them did. And in a single day, 23,000 people fell dead. That was the other thing that they did. They violated they, they violated it. They committed. Of course, th this, there was a, a sorcerer. There's a sorcerer called Balaam. This sorcerer was called to, to cast the children of Israel. He tried to cast them and God, God came through. You know, God is faithful, brethren. He was trying to cast them and instead he would bless them. Hey, brethren, you know, you, you have been blessed, brethren. When the devil is trying to cast you, he, uh, you know, he cannot manage. <laughs> but Balaam advised them. Advised, uh, uh, Balaam advised, who was that? Uh, uh, he advised, uh, Balaam advised who? Barak. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Baram advised Barak. Thank you so much. You guys, you are Bible students. That uh, that root will not succeed with God. But if you want God to turn against his people, go and seduce them. They got the, um, the Moabite and the Midianite women. Go and seduce them to fall into sin. When they fall into sin, you will not need to fight. God will fight them. No, he, he knew God. He knew God's terms and conditions. And he did that. And you know what? In a single day, 23,000 of them fell dead. Brethren, let us run away from sexual immorality. If you are not married, God has the grace of celibacy. Brethren, there is enough grace. I'm telling you the truth. There is enough grace. Amen. Because the moment you walk the route of sexual immorality, God's presence will not walk with you. You may not be cast because God will protect you. But if the devil turns and you become, um, um, you violate that and you become, you sin, is, is a sexual sin, either through uh, pornography, masturbation, or having another girlfriend or a boyfriend, that you are walking with the Lord and nobody even knows about it, God's presence will not go with you. For those of us who are married, let's be faithful. That is it. You know some people, Go and sin and pray. Come and say, oh, hallelujah, God's presence. Move around here. They think God's presence is brought by loud voices and prayers. It's not brought by loud voices and prayers. It's brought by walking in holiness. Yes. The Bible says in uh, First Thessalonians chapter, chapter 4, should be verse, could I remember that verse, which the Bible talks about how to get married. We should get married in a holy and honorable way. Can you get us that one? You know, God tells us how we should... And let me just say this, brethren, I'm speaking in low voices because, because I'm a pastor. <laughs> Those of us who are married and you do not have documents, please get the documents. You might go to heaven and be shocked when you see records, say, you guys, you are never married. According to our records here, you are never married. Say, no, no, she's here. No, according to our records. Brethren, these things are serious. For, um, for this abstain from a section that abstain, let's go to the other one. You may be very shocked. God, I was married. No, you are not. Um, abstain, possess a vessel with sanctification and honor. Get married in sanctification and honor. Let's do it the right way. There, it's not too late to do things the right way. Just do it. Do it. Brethren, let's be faithful to our spouses. Is that too much for God to ask? It's not too much compared to eternity and God's presence. So we want to go with God's presence. If you jump from a prosperous place like Samson, and of course God would, would again do quite some miracles. Let's not, God cannot be mocked. Let's go to the other one. I want just to, to finalize now. I can see my time. It's not on my side. You are there. Uh, go back to, oh, we were in first. We were looking at the four things in first the Corinthians chapter 10. We were at the second one. So please, uh, can go back to that place. Yeah. So please, about working on those of us who are trapped in um, masturbation and pornography, we are here. We can walk with you, brethren. Please don't don't die. We've had some people come forward, and we've worked with many people. D don't just say, God will understand. God knows what is happening. No, just just come out, come out. 
And of course, I had already said this, that if you, there are those people who feel like you want babies, but you don't want marriage, ask God to remove the desire for babies, because babies are supposed to come uh, through marriage. Tell God, God, I want your presence. Remove this. this. It's a holy, unholy desire. Children without marriage. Um, let's trust the Lord for those who are born again that we can walk that route. We are there. Let us, uh, let us not tempt Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. Tempting Christ. I think this one is where, this one is linked to what we were saying. Where you would, um, you know, the children of Israel were asking, can God make a table on the desert? And they were told they were tempting the Lord. They were tempting Jesus Christ. In other words, these are things that you do and actually they can amount to tempting Jesus because for example, when you put conditions for God, for Christ, to do for you before you do something or you are faithful, that would be termed to be testing the Lord. Let's go to the last one. Um, nor should we complain, as some of them did, and were killed by destroyer. And I'm telling you that one of the things I fight personally, uh, let me confess, I, I fight personally. My wife keeps telling me that, especially when we are on the way and a vehicle overtakes me in the wrong way, I complain a lot. I, I see her looking at me, and I'm still praying that God would help me, rescue me from... I com, com, I, you know, I find opportunities to complain. And may God help us not to find... There's a time I used... I would come to worship, and then I would complain so much about the praise and worship team, because I'm like, brethren, you know, bring this thing. And therefore, I would not even worship. I remember there was a church I was in... The keyboard and the, the I, th I, I don't think they ever, they were ever together, the keyboard and the. <laughs> so it came a time when I would even go deliberately late so that I avoid complaining. But I discovered you can actually co overcome complaining, brethren. You can actually say, Jesus, they may not be coordinated, but Jesus, you, you are coordinated. <laughs> you can worship and pray together with them because they are also. Some of them are also struggling and they are saying, oh God, help us. We, you can overcome complaining. You can overcome complaining in church, um, especially you know, in church. You see, there are quite a number of things in church that do not happen the right way. I don't know whether you know that by now, uh, if you have been a Christian for several years. There are things that don't happen the way they were supposed to happen, quite a bit. And we need to trust the Lord that we can be able to talk instead of complaining. We can be able to look at that person and talk to them instead of going somewhere and complaining. Because the Bible says that when you do that, God's presence will not go together with you. Even in our places of work, I, th I think the, the worst place is our place of work, brethren. You know, that is where, in fact, the church is better compared to the place of work. There, things are worse. You know, you find a boss who does things the wrong way, violates the very policy that he tells you to, to follow. And you have a very good reason why you should misbehave and why you should not do the right thing. Brethren, and, but God has really helped me over the years, not to complain about my employer, because my employer is, you know, was not one of the most good employers. And I'm sure yours is, is no better. But, but the Bible teaches, we can learn. One time I had to learn to, to, to be able to face our principal and just tell him instead of complaining somewhere else. And I discovered, by the way, there's a lot of good that comes after, from that. Well, of course, you have to start to do it the right way. You have to say, it, ever since you came here, it, you have been the best. And make sure you're speaking the truth. Make sure you are, can say, but there's one thing that I think if you can do it, it can be better. Let's learn, learn not to complain. In our family, oh, another bless, oh my God. With our families, our parents and our spouses, brothers and children. You know, like leaving the house is, leaving the house is, is another business altogether. Eating is another, going to sleep is another major conflict. And may God help us not to complain, especially as parents. And children have a very good way of knowing that the parents are not doing the right thing. And we can be full of complaining. I'm telling you, when we do that, God will not be together with us. You can face your parents, you can face your spouse, you can face your children. You can talk to them instead of complaining. One of the greatest things that you might ever learn is how do I communicate without complaining? Because even if you say you're not complaining with your mouth, your heart might be complaining already. So you have not solved the problem. So let us learn how we can be able to approach people and be summon enough courage and talk. Even about our government, brethren. We need to learn how to... I'm not saying we should endure every evil. Some needs to be con con confronted. Let us come up with systems that we can be able to do that in a godly way.
We can tell the government, excuse me, government, we are here, we are peaceful. We are very peaceful, by the way. <laughs> but we are standing, and we are not going to stone anyone. We are not going to do anything. Even in, in a school like this one, where admission, administration is going haywire, students who are believers can go in front and face leaders and talk to them with respect and honor. We can do it with respect and honor and sanctification. I'm telling you, things can work. I want us to pray. Our Father and our God, we have looked at these three, four things that can come our way, and when they come our way, the presence of God may not go together with us. We have seen the children of Israel, what they did in the desert, and their bodies lay in the desert. Why? Especially because of these four things that God I would want to make a prayer about. God Almighty, the first one is idolatry. God as people, we have grown up and there are things that we value in this life. We value them a lot. And we can do anything to get them. Including using you to get them. And when you don't get us those things, we become angry with you and we become offended. May you help us, Lord, to destroy, to pull down those idols. And to tell you that, God, you take over our lives. That even if these things never come, God will be faithful to you. Again, we have seen about the sexual sin. That God makes your presence to go together with us. It's a rampant sin, God, in our time. It is all over the place. It's in the internet, in the houses, in the workplaces. And Father God, we find ourselves compromised in our thoughts, in our thinking, in our minds. We have been compromised, oh God. We pray for rescue. Those of us that God Almighty are struggling in those areas, we know you are gracious. You want to help us. The entire church can work together and we can be helped. God Almighty, those who would want to marry, you can help them to marry in a honorable and way of sanctification. We pray that God will help us not to walk in sexual immorality, but to walk in faithfulness. We have also seen about not testing you, not testing the Lord, walking in unbelief and think that God cannot do anything, whether good or bad. That God we will trust that you are able to do the right thing. And lastly, God, this great thing about complaining and grumbling, which God came and you slay, many were slain because of complaining. You told them that their bodies will lie in the wilderness because they complained and doubted your power and your goodness and your mercy. May we not doubt it. As children of Christ, of Christ Jesus, as people that have uh, been baptized, have walked and taken the spiritual milk, have taken uh, the spiritual uh, drink and the spiritual food, have walk, been walking with the rock who is Christ our Savior. May we not reach a stage where verse 5 says, but the Lord was not pleased with many of them because they desired evil. May we not desire evil. May we desire good. May we walk together with you because you are our Lord. For I pray this in Jesus' name.